This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Hold on to that. Welcome back to the Shit Show 2.0. Okay, Boomer. Damn millennials. Wow. <laughs> Did not know that. Even flirters who who are obviously mentally ill. You want to be my wife? Oh, this is gonna go downhill real quick. <laughs> What is going on? And welcome to Take on the World with Johnny McDonald and Mike D. We are here once again in the cave. What's Down going on, bud? The Bat Cave. The Labat Cave. The the Libit Cave. What's going on? Um, I don't know. I am lost my train of thought. Woo-woo. What's going on with you? Left the station. <laughs> I just had a senior moment. Great. Uh, not too much. I'm kind of liking this topic you sent me. Yeah, I'm kind of up in the air about it. I don't know. Well, you said you 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 saw it and you thought it was interesting. Uh, I I had known about this. I had heard about this before. I'd watched some videos on this before. So I think this is right up there with the word I can't pronounce. Go ahead. Try. You're kind to infect them. No, hinterkai effect. Hinterkaifect murders, which it's, it was like, oh, okay, this sounds pretty interesting. And then I started watching some stuff on it, and like, dude, I, I just, I don't know, man. I my attention span is so fucking short. So that's because you scroll through and watch all those short videos. I know instant gratification. No, this one I actually watched a couple. Uh, I think they were like 15, 20 minute videos. Well, I know on the one website I went, there's like a forty three minute video on this. Yeah. And I think it might be the one that I watched before. Okay. Um, but <clears throat> this is the uh, Circleville Letters. Uh, and if you haven't heard about it, stick around. We're going to talk about it. But before we do that, we want to talk about the Deluxe Edition Network, which we are a proud part of. It's a group of podcasters got together, and uh, we're taking on the universe. That's right. Uh, basically, we help each other out, promote each other. Uh just like a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, from Barrel Age Flicks, we had Chase on with us doing um, uh, Bigfoot and Paranormal and Cryptids. Uh, and I think it was very successful. We had a great time. We're going to make that a, a regular thing with him. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. That was a, that was good. So along with our, our regular stuff, we're going to throw in some, uh, some of the uh, Paranormal and Cryptid stuff. And we're going to have Chase be our SME. Our subject matter expert. <laughs> um, I think uh, we're going to do the uh, the mysterious stairways in the woods. Oh, yes. So if you haven't heard about it, you know, take a peek at it. Uh, I don't know that I believe in them <clears throat> because I'm the resident skeptic. Uh, but um, I still find the stories interesting. They're there. I climbed them. Ooh, what happened? <laughs> Save it for the show, bro. Save it for the show. <laughs> Anyway, uh, while you oh, go, go to deluxeeditionnetwork.com, and while you're there, you want to check out the podcast of the month because we have them every month. And for the month of May, this month, the podcast of the month are. <laughs> Barrel Aged Chicks. Are you into movies, pop culture, and comedy? Well, you got to sit down and see what the ladies think. Come meet Sammy, Snow, Crystal, Harley, and Yen as they give you the chick's perspective on movies and much, much more. This is the female side of the barrel age flicks, fellers. And uh, they started up their own thing because the guys just talk too much, I guess. I don't know what it is. So grab a few beers and uh, sit down and listen to the chicks talk. Coffee Brothers sources seasonal, award-winning, and specialty coffees. Focusing on high scoring and high quality blends, espresso roast, and single origin coffees, which are all small batch roasted. Experience complex taste notes from fragrant and aromatic to bold and rich. 
Coffee Brothers Coffee is a two-person brother team, hence the name. They roast all of their coffees in small batches out of their New York City roastery. Go to coffeebros.com and use TOTW10 for discount at checkout. Barstool Film School, a controversial comedy breakdown of some of their favorite flicks, old and new. Each episode, they take on your favorite flicks to determine if they pass the bar and join the ranks of the truly ex excellent bar movies. Good bar movies can be hit or miss, but you'll never know until you take your shot. And the first round is on them. I'm in for that. Yeah, those are some great podcasts. And um, uh, also check out that uh, Coffee Brothers Coffee and uh, put in an order and support the show. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Uh, I, I tell you firsthand, I love that coffee. I'm not just saying it. <laughs> that coffee was awesome. First, the aromas coming off of it, the smell. Yeah. And then made it in the shop, made everybody jealous. Oh, yeah. That was so good. <clears throat> So, yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Anywho. Much needed. So, moving on. The Circleville Letters. <clears throat> so, uh, you might be saying to yourself, what's so interesting about some letters from Circleville? It's a little town I've never heard of. Well, it's a little town in Ohio. So, I don't know what's up with Ohio and all the weird crap that goes on there. Yeah. But... Circleville, Ohio is about 20 mi 25 miles south uh, of Columbus, Ohio, with a population. Wherever the hell that is. As You don't know where Columbus is? It's kind of in the middle. I don't even know where Ohio is. It's the next state over from us, dude. <sighs> to the left, to the Illinois. left. Illinois. It's before Illinois. <laughs> that, you know, it drives me nuts now, and I feel, hear people say Illinois. Yeah. There's no noise in Illinois. <laughs> I was like my mom used to say, ain't, ain't a word. <laughs> and ain't gonna say it. So it's uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. This is <laughs> Ohio's. Um, it's 25 miles south of Columbus. In 2020, it had a population of 13,927. What is their, what is their big foot? They call him grass man. Don't I think he's grass man. Grass man. He's like a, he's, so he was good. He was gonna climb the mountain, but then he got high. <laughs> he's around smoking weed. So this little town was terrorized for nearly two decades, <laughs> not by the grass man, but by someone sending anonymous, threatening letters <laughs> that exposed alleged secrets about residents in the town. So now when when I research this, it makes it sound like they were sending them to everybody. But Yeah, that's what I got confused with too. When you do the actual research, it seems like they were focused on <clears throat> one or two people. Um there might have been more, I don't know. Uh I don't re it's been a while since I saw the uh program on this. So now nah, we'll just make it up as we go. So I think that the letters started in the 70s? Yes. 77. The 76 or 77 is when, when they started. And they, so they went to like 87. No, 97. Yeah, two decades. Two decades. Dos decados. Uh, oh, <laughs> very next line. <laughs> Yeah, oh, Mikey, jump ahead. You stealing my fucking bag. Yeah. <laughs> so in 1976, residents of Centerville, Ohio, received uh, started receiving peculiar letters disclosing personal details. Mary Gillespie, uh, a bus driver, was falsely accused of having an affair with the school superintendent. <clears throat> The anonymous writer claimed to have been monitoring Mary's house, knowing about her children. So now uh, I'm going to I'm going to flash back and forth to some of these letters and I'm going to let Johnny read them to you because he's got a creepy voice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, little boy, you want some candy? We're to have that window. 
We're going to have the letter window. I'm going to take a look at the back of my van. Are you going to, are these going to be on the, so they can see them? I'll try to download them then. Because it's just, they're hard to read because the way they're written, this is very strange handwriting. So this says P2, so I don't know. There might have been a letter before this, but. Yeah, why would you start your page two with, maybe they ousted or outed somebody on the first page. This was to the the Mr. Miss, Superintendent. Miss Gillespie. And then this was to the whore bus driver. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Gillespie, stay away from Massey, who's the superintendent. Don't lie when questioned about meeting him. I know where you live. I've been over. I've I've been observing your house, and know you have children. This is no joke. Please take it serious. Everyone concerned has been notified, and everything will be over soon. <clears throat> Look, I gotta say that everyone concerned has been notified. That is some creepy shit. <clears throat> so, uh, this must be not the first letter. This must be his side. His other side piece is getting a little. A little jelly. Uh, this is not the first letter because in the coming up, uh, it was about eight days off uh, where <clears throat> she received another letter. I want to see what was on page one of that letter. I, uh, I don't have them in order. Um, see, that I hate that's what's great about technology, but then sometimes when you can't find something, like page one of this letter. It pisses me off. Oh, shit. There's the thing in the thing you were don't, talking about. Don't, don't say nothing. We're not there yet. No, I know. Don't Johnny jump ahead of me. Who do you think I am? <clears throat> Fuck it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. We can't help it. <clears throat> um, we'll just keep going until we... <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> the letters are postmarked from Columbus but lacked a return uh, address. Uh, Mary received another letter within eight days, prompting her to confide in her husband, Ron. Ron had received a threatening letter warning him of dire consequences if he didn't intervene in his wife's alleged affair. I'd like to find that letter. I know I've seen it. We're going to kill you if you don't kill him. Uh, there, there, there was some very harsh threats. Is that the... I don't know if that's the husband. Let me see. That's the husband. Like this person was pissed off. You done fucked up. Hey, hey, the wrong. wrong person off. Oh, there's page one right there. I know everything. The sheriff. Forever. Why would they fuzz that out? I don't know. Stay away from him. Noon and as well as night. Oh, stay away from him noon and as well as night. If I can't get you together and you make a fool of me, such as the school has done, I shall come out there and put a bullet in that little girl's head. Remember, I haven't followed him for nothing. Too many think this is a joke. We'll see in time. I know where you live. I've been wait- watching your house. Psycho. Okay. Two weeks later, the writer, the writer escalated threats vowing to sp- expose the alleged affair through various media channels like TV, CB radios, and billboard. CB radios were a media at the point. <laughs> Dude, that's crazy, man. Uh, all that tea talk on the truckers radios. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mary and Ron confided in only three individuals about the letters. Ron's sister, her husband, Paul Fresh F- Fresh Hour, and Paul's sister. So basically did the opposite of what the, the, the letter said. Well, the letter said you better come clean. No, remember it said you better have Ron handle this shit. Oh. Or I'm going to handle Ron. Well, she told Ron. <clears throat> Ron was supposed to do his. I'm assuming Ron was supposed to go. I don't know. Beat the fuck out of Massey. Beat the shit out of Massey. Uh, 
Mary had a suspicion of the sender's identity and with others <clears throat> devise, and with others devised a strategy involving Paul writing letters to the suspect pretending to have identified him. <laughs> so they did this. They they wrote these letters. I don't know how they wrote them wrote them back. There's no <laughs> send it to some some random dude. Or they sent it to the person they thought it was. Uh, this tactic appeared successful as the letters ceased for a period of several weeks. On August 19, 1977, a significant turn occurred when Ron received a phone call from the sp suspected letter writer, strengthening his suspicion about the center's identity. It's, why are they not releasing that information? I don't know. Maybe it's under investigation. I don't know. Well, or it was at the time. Well, there was a whole. <clears throat> well, here we, we'll get into it. No, this whole thing is so far, uh, so weird. Yes. Uh, despite the caller's claim of observing Ron's truck, Ron armed himself with a gun and left in America. his pickup truck. Shortly after, Ron was discovered dead in his pickup truck, <laughs> having crashed into a tree. Wait, crashed into a tree? Investigation re revealed he had discharged his gun before his crash. Hmm. Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe investigated the crash, initially considering foul play, but later ruling Ron's death an accident, attributing it to drunk driving. <clears throat> Despite the sheriff's conclusion, subsequent letters accused him of a cover-up. Paul claimed the sheriff initially suspected foul play until the prime suspect passed a polygraph test. Whoa, where was he going? Was he going to this alleged, this guy's house to go? He, he, supposedly, he was, I think he was going after the dude who he thought it was. And he freaking got so drunk, he crashed into a tree and discharged his shotgun? Listen, I'm not going to, dude. I think it was a 22 caliber revolver. The drink is pretty strong. People do some crazy stuff. Well, they said his blood alcohol level was found to be 0.16, twice the legal limit, which surprised many who knew him that they didn't, they didn't perceive him as a heavy drinker. Wait, so there was a limit in the 70s? Point, point oh 0.08. I thought it was like legal to drive drunk. <laughs> No, I mean, I'm, I'm not, <coughs> I've heard stories of people getting, well, well, I guess pulled over and one as a person I know that stopped at the, uh, this was the seventies, stopped at the, um, the toll booth. I guess they like fell asleep or something <laughs> at the thing. And the cop comes up and was like, Empty bottle of whiskey on the floor. Like, hey, you all right? No, oh, yeah, yeah. Where are you going? I'm going home. Just slow it down a little bit. Or they or tell whatever. him to pull over and sleep it off. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. So <clears throat> here's where it gets a little twisty, even more. Oh, twist it up, baby. Mary and the superintendent eventually admitted to the relationship, asserting it had begun after the letters were received. I mean, what are the odds? Like, man, I'm starting to like this this lady bus driver. So the she's pretty good looking. The um, apparently the letter writer might have known what they were talking about. I don't it, know. Do you believe that that uh, it happened afterwards? It happened afterwards. Just probably coincidentally. Not. Probably not. I mean, what? what uh, Anyway, sorry, go ahead. In February 1983, Mary faced harassment during during her bus route with threatening signs being placed along the road by the letter writer. Fed up, Mary decided to remove one of the signs herself but found a deadly booby trap concealed within it. The trap consisted of a box containing a small pistol designed to discharge if the sign was moved in a specific manner. Now, I call all kinds of fucked up on that. Yeah, because anybody could take that. A sign little out. kid could have pulled that sign up. 
And that's taking a big risk, you know, assuming that she's going to take one of these signs out, that exact sign with multiple signs. Yeah. <clears throat> but then I don't think we're dealing with a rational person here. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so either. You know what? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be fucking, well, maybe I'll save this towards the end. Okay. That's my conclusion. Okay. So an attempt was made to erase a serial number from the gun, but forensic analysis successfully revealed it belonged to Paul Freshnor. Fresh hour. Fresher hour. Okay. We're getting somewhere. Paul, who had recently separated from Ron's sister. Fresh whore. Is that it? <laughs> he's, a, he's a fresh whore. Uh, claimed the gun had been stolen. On February 25th, 1983, Sheriff Radcliffe made Paul undergo a handwriting test, asking him to mimic the letters handwriting while verbalizing them. Okay, I have a problem with this. I do, too. There's obviously, absolutely, um, what am I trying to say? Um, 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 differences and in, in similarities in handwriting. You could tell, like, if you look at some of like the way I write things, like some of my letters connect in a certain way that's just kind of unique, you know, or how you sign your name. This, the letters that are on this, if you, if you show the picture and you'll see it, they're, they're like boxy. Like anybody could do that. Yeah. So yes, it's going to look, it's going to look the same pretty much if anyone wrote that. Well, see, I feel, I disagree because you see how all the letters are canted. They're all canted in, in in a direction. Like he starts off on this end, like only canted a little bit. And this end, they're they're tipped like a stack of chairs tipping over, straight up, way back, straight up. And that's something subconscious. Hey. Every sentence is like that: straight up, canted, straighter up, canted farther. Every line. Okay. <clears throat> but that's what that's what these handwriting people right. look at. Uh, you know, um, that's to me that's not enough. And also, like, uh, I would look at the way you spell things, or like, well, they do. Things. They look at grammar and, and the way they yeah. spell things. They look for pen falls too. So, like, uh, some people naturally rest their pen after like certain words, mm -hmm. uh, like longer words. You rest your pen as you're moving your hand over, mm -hmm. and th they'll look for those, and they'll like they'll rest it like here in that the crook of the R or the rest of down at the bottom. And you, you'll you see that impression in, and they'll do that <clears throat> a, a lot on the same letters. And if they repeat words, they'll, they'll do it when they repeat that word. And it's all subconscious, yeah. man. I love, I love things that have to do with like handwriting analysis. Like you think like a side note here, but like the Jack the Ripper case um, and the Zodiac killer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of that was they were looking heavily into their handwriting. Uh, so, but now I, I see what you're saying with that. The, that's interesting because I didn't notice that until you pointed it out. Like, it's very, so you get sloppy towards the end. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I want to get to the next line. Right. But he didn't do it as much here. Right. Which makes me think maybe he was drinking. It get, you, you get tireder because you're, you're tired. You're, you're irritated. Yep. You're getting more agitated as you see so you're writing faster. And I feel like the faster you write, the more you're going to write like yourself. If you're trying to disguise your handwriting somewhat, and you're being methodical about it. It seems it's going to look perfect, but the faster you go, the more imperfections you see. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, following the test, Paul showed the sheriff where he had stored his gun in his garage, after which he was arrested and charged with attempted murder. So he stood trial in October of 83. Because they thought it was him? They, not for the letters. For the gun. For the, attempt, for the attempted murder of uh, Mary Gillespie. Damn. Uh, he was never formally charged with the writing of the letters. Despite the absence of direct charges, the letters constituted vital evidence, and a handwriting expert identified Paul as the likely writer. The belief echoed by Mary and uh, supported by Paul's wife, uh, a similar suspicion. 
So everybody's saying, yeah, I okay. think it was Paul. So was there any other than the fact that they found out who the gun belonged to? Was he, did he have any relationship or anything with these people? Uh, or was he just Paul? Hey, I'm Paul. The- Paul Fresh, Fresh Hour was mentioned all the way back in the beginning as uh, one of the people that Ron and they thought that was doing it. No, Mary and Ron confided in three individuals. Ron's sister, her husband, Ron's sister is uh, Paul Freshour and Paul's sister. That Those were the three people that they originally confided in. So wait, hold on. Go back up there again real quick. Yeah, <laughs> Shane. What would you have that? Yeah, right. Ron's sister, her husband, Paul. Okay, gotcha. So it was, so it was brother Ron, Ron's brother-in-law, yeah. So, um, uh, I like he must have been some kind of fucking kook. Well, hold on. Wait, there's more. Uh oh. <laughs> um. <clears throat> additionally, Paul's absence from work that day of the booby trap discovery was attested to by his employer during the trial. Paul had an alibi for most of the day, but opted not to testify in his defense during the trial. Despite maintaining his innocence, he was convicted and sentenced to seven to 24 years in prison. Ouch. While incarcerated, Paul received letters from the original, from the original sender, even though he was confined in Lima. Lima? Lima? I don't know what that means. And the letters are po- postmarked from Columbus. I guess it might be a, a, where the Town, prison is. Yeah, yeah. the prison. Uh, <clears throat> despite being in solitary confinement, the letters persisted, indicating someone else was responsible. Uh, in December 1990, Paul became eligible for parole, but was denied due to the ongoing letters. So, I wonder what the letters are saying to Paul. Okay, one of those letters that I pulled up earlier. Let me see if I can go back and find it because I left them up. All right, this is, I was trying to, okay, this one's very hard to read. First, it says March, looks like 1944, but I'm going to say. 94, maybe? I think it's going to be a 1994 or 99. March 9, we'll say either 94 or 99. It says, please know, letters were be- letters were before 1999. Or 77. Or 77. Uh, that could be a 99, too. And it looks like a, yeah. But it doesn't match those nines. No, not at all. But continue. Letters were before 1999. Writer almost, I don't know, what NRO? Had. H-A-D. Oh, okay. Writer almost had another incident. Man put in prison. Innocent. Oh, writer almost had another innocent man put in prison. Ha ha. Ha ha. Druid? David Longberry. Jesus Christ. Maybe you should read this, Michael. Yeah, I'm good at reading. David Longberry would have... <sighs> Would have if the man in prison now was not tried to trick writer with writer's own writing for home breaker Gillespie's. See what he got. Ha ha. He will not get out of prison or Radcliffe will take his place. There was foul play. And then something's blocked out, markered out. <clears throat> they are still together. Two teenage boys seen what happened. You always use high speed for elimination of someone if you must get rid of them. See, what the? F- what does any of that mean? Radcliffe is a sheriff. I, yeah, I know that. I, they lost me big time. At so, it just sounds like, like just nonsensical jibber jabber. Uh, a lot of it is, but what he's saying here, Radcliffe, uh, 
had to eliminate somebody. So they said it was a high speed accident, and that's how he usually tries to get rid of people. So it, it it's so they're saying right close to the guilty party, more, more than likely nonsense. But and then he killed uh, what's his face, Ron. Yeah, to cover it up or pin it on Ron, which it wasn't pinned on Ron. <laughs> um, that, yeah, that letter kind of loses me a little bit. Well, the, he, it couldn't have been uh, 99 because 94 he was paroled. He was finally paroled in 1994. Paul continues to assert <clears throat> his innocence while the true identity of the letter writer remains undisclosed. So Unsolved Mysteries covered this. 60 Minutes covered this. I'd like to see the Unsolved Mysteries one of this. Uh, investigative journalism journalist Martin Yant uncovered another potential suspect in a case and noted a sighting of suspicious individual near the booby trap location prior to his discovery. The suspect's brother owned a yellow El Camino matching description provided by a witness, further casting doubt on Paul's involvement. Postcard received by Unsolved Mystery during filming. Content. Forget Circleville, Ohio. Do nothing to hurt Sheriff Radcliffe. If you come to Ohio, you El Sickos will pay. The Circleville writer. That's what was written on the postcard. Huh. Uh, there were some extra notes on the website. I got this from it said uh, November 11th, uh, 1994 was the original air date of the episode. Uh, Sheriff Radcliffe and Mary Gillespie declined interviews for the story. Alleged admission by Paul to Sheriff Radcliffe. Uh, Paul confessed in right to writing between 40 and 50 le of the Circleville letters. Supposedly. Following the broadcast of Unsolved Mysteries, Circleville writer sent postcard to the show's P.O. box, but their rem identity remains un undisclosed. I mean, the admitting to the letters, I can kind of take it or leave it. Because there's a lot of, unless you read the transcripts of what they talked about, like how long was he being interrogated for? And there's a lot of like, I'm not saying it's going to, this it happened in this case, but there could be coercion. Yeah. Uh, sleep deprivation, you know the tactics, right? They use. Like, like we talked about with the uh, Reykjavik convictions, yeah. <clears throat> um, Paul Freshnor Fresh Hour was main uh, who maintained a blog for years, passed away in 2012 without learning <clears throat> the Circle Boat Writer's identity. Uh, recent revelations by Martin Yant and others suggested the involvement of. <laughs> At Ooh. least three letter He's writers dead. in the case, none of whom which were Paul. The son of the superintendent, uh, who Mary had an affair with, a co-worker who, inf who was infatuated with Mary, and Paul's ex-wife, Ron Gillespie's sister, whose boyfriend was spotted near the booby trap location. Hmm. Despite the evidence, police maintained Paul was a circle of a writer, the case was parodied in Drunk History, where comedians speculated about Mary Gillespie's involvement, but no follow-up on this theory emerged. Oh, wait, hold on. Paul's ex-wife, which was Ron's sister? Yes. We covered that earlier. Ron, Ron was, uh, Paul was Ron's brother-in-law. Mm-hmm. But they, they, they got divorced. Paul and, and oh, I got okay. All right, yeah. What the? F this is a lot of names. This is like some. This is what I. All these names and these accusations flying around. I have to read this thing like four times to understand but it. This <clears throat> this Martin Yance just giving uh, what they found could be other people who wrote the letters. Right. It wasn't sixty minutes. It was forty eight hours. Okay. I was wrong. Rawong. In August 2021, 48 Hours featured an interview with a handwriting expert, Beverly East, who asserted 
Fresh Hour was the perpetrator based on handwriting analysis. However, he could have written letters. How he could have written letters from prison remains unclear, raising questions about potential accomplices. I mean, I don't see how it would be unclear. So my problem with the whole story is they make it sound like this whole town was terrorized by these letters. And it seems like it wasn't the whole town. It wasn't the whole town. It was just a couple people, <clears throat> but well, still sure it's a small town. They talked about it, but like, still there's like a hundred lever- letters written. We've only seen what, like maybe 12 of them. Yeah. And why, are, why are some of them fuzzed out? Some are like blocked. Yeah. Why, why, why is some of it redacted? Redacted. Yes. Yeah, it's odd. Yeah. But this is what I was going to say earlier is I wouldn't be surprised if it was somebody within that small circle. Not some because or <clears throat> um, let's say Ron. But then he did die and the letters continued. Yeah. So the the suspects boil down to uh, an infatuated co-worker. A jilted lover, or a jilted wannabe lover. Right. <clears throat> uh, the, the sister of the guy who went to jail for the whole thing. Right. So the ex-wife, which women can be vindictive. Well, no, he didn't go for the, to the jail for the letters. He went to jail for the gun. Right. The booby trap. Right. Well, she could. She would have access access, access to the gun. True. And she could have set him up. Yeah. <clears throat> Paid somebody to do it. Yeah. Here, here's the keys to my husband's car. But they used the letters in court to convict them, even though he was never charged with writing the threatening letters. So it's just like, just an added freaking, yeah, take that bitch. Extra, <clears throat> an extra thumpy thump. I don't know, man. That's just weird. Yeah, it is. But it would have to be, it just couldn't be some random dude that it's like, hey, I'm going to fuck with these six people. No, nah, it, it the whole thing was too personal. Somebody was upset. The miss bus driver either she sounds like the freaking town bicycle. If you ask me, she pissed somebody off because she stopped giving it up. <clears throat> That's the second bicycle reference in two shows. <laughs> what the. <clears throat> I don't know. I guess that's why you don't get involved with a bus driver. <laughs> a married bus driver. So that's that's the Circleville. Well, that Ohio. wasn't nearly as confusing as the Hint, Hinter Kaifek. So I was going to say it wrong, and right off the bat, I had it wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> I knew you were going down that road. But this letters, man, that one last, the last letter I wrote, it just sounded like drunk gibberish. And the handwriting was terrible. I could hardly read it. I mean, talking about two little, two young boys saw the whole, seen the whole thing. Yeah. Well, that's one of the, the things that was mentioned in some place where I did my research that the, <clears throat> uh, the grammar was horrible mm-hmm. and uh, the handwriting was juvenile. To me, that sounds like somebody got wasted and just went on a rant and wrote this letter. I think I'm going to, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to write this. Stop fucking the principal. They <laughs> <laughs> were supposed to get married in a bus in Mexico. But they should dump me for the superintendent. Blah, 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 blah. blah. <clears throat> If I can't get none, nobody's joined. <laughs> Jilted lover, my ass. <laughs> so we took on <clears throat> the hinter. No, <laughs> the circle jerk bill- the letters. <laughs> letters. Circle bill letters. Now you go take on the world. 
Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Dylan. And I'm Cameron. And we're the hosts of Barstool Film School, a conversational comedy podcast about the very best bar movies. You know, the ones that are like perfect to watch when you're hanging out in a bar with friends. Now, uh, I'm a writer and a film school washout. And I'm a bar owner. So we ought to know what we're talking about. <laughs> you would hope. Tune in every other week, wherever you get your pods, as we take on a new flick. And we will pair those flicks with some cocktails. To see if they pass the bar. Now, uh, what do you say, Cam? Shall we pour ourselves another round? Let's do it. All right. All right.